money now and a lot more when I get in that office. I can take that to the bank. I'm gonna take you to the bank, Senator Trent. To the blood bank. It's no secret that in recent years, Steven Seagal has become at best complacent, and at worst, a bit of a dick. He's pushing out work at a pretty rapid pace, though it would be hard to tell one of his more recent films from the other, and his public image has taken one hell of a self-cause beating. So what actually was the appeal of Steven Seagal during his most successful years? What was it about this guy that has allowed him to still push out movies that some people somewhere must actually watch? His contemporaries have reinvented themselves, growing and evolving with their work and finding actual success. From JCVD's genuinely decent dramatic roles to Dolph Lundgren's pretty okay stab at the director's chair, hell, Chuck Norris appears to have become even more popular in recent years. So what happened to this guy and why did we like him in the first place? At 64, he is the same age as current action star Liam Neeson. One would expect Seagal would be a go-to for the same roles that Neeson seems to have the pick of these days. After all, Seagal is actually able to do the martial arts his characters are supposed to. He's a master in Aikido and made sure that was very much represented throughout his career. However, since the mid-90s, his box office returns dipped dramatically to the point that he was quickly relegated to the director video market, and now apart from the odd theatrical appearance, pretty much exclusively low-budget DVD and VOD films. Favoring large jackets, tight framing, and choosing to spend much of his time sitting down to cover his matured shape, with only very quick flashes of his trademark Aikido action, he seems to either not be able to or not interested in evolving as an actor the way other action stars have. But once, admittedly quite long ago now, Seagal was a genuinely formidable screen presence, with a string of hits in the late 80s through to the mid 90s that any actor would be proud of. Following the success of his first film Above the Law, he grew into a very dependable bankable star. Though his later work devolved into generally poor straight-to-video flicks with the odd half-decent effort here or there, for a short while he was appearing in genuinely decent action and crime thrillers. That's the thing for me that I find interesting about Steven Seagal. I don't want to get into who he is so much, the things he stands for, as that's been done far better than I ever could in Seagalogy, a study of the ass-kicking films of Steven Seagal by Verne. And I can say it's one of the best books you could ever hope to read if you have an interest in Seagal or action films in general. But there is something genuinely fascinating about these earlier films that I want to explore briefly. As said before, there was once an appeal to Seagal, Something that really made him a household name. But was it about him? Or the films he appeared in? The thing about Seagal's earlier stuff as said is that generally they are decent flicks. They're almost less action films and more crime thrillers. After the over-the-top bombast of the 80s muscle-bound one-man army heroes, Seagal felt more like a from-the-street, straight-talking, genuine guy who happened to know martial arts. And you believed it as that's kind of what he was, or at least how he appeared. Like a cross between the fast-talking everyman John McClane and the hard-hitting martial artist Van Damme, he ushered in the 90s action hero with his genuinely fascinating use of a then pretty unseen martial art and his tough, formidable, but still believable appearance. For me though, what really made Seagal, of course, was the films he appeared in. In his first five films, Above the Law, Hard to Kill, Marked for Death, Out for Justice, and Under Siege, he worked with interesting, experienced directors in films that surrounded him with great character actors that helped elevate his work from cheap, interchangeable action films with interchangeable three-word titles to actual decent entertainment. Too bad even during this period of genuine success, he still looks a little bit silly when running. Andrew Davis, who helmed The Fugitive right after his final Seagal collaboration, bookended this period of success, directing both Seagal's first film Above the Law and his biggest success, Under Siege. Having worked previously with Chuck Norris on Code of Silence in 1985, you can see Davis's evolution from trashier films through his films of Seagal to his Oscar-winning The Fugitive. His Chuck Norris action film chops made him a perfect fit to bring Seagal to the big screen, and his down and dirty shooting style fit the character of Nico well. When it came to Under Siege, both director and actor had developed significantly, and together they made one of the more memorable Die Hard on a Something films, this time using that formula for some battleship action. Surrounding Seagal with better actors, including Tommy Lee Jones in a very unrestrained bad guy role, really makes Under Siege work with Seagal's typically understated delivery feeling right against Jones and Busey, two larger-than-life personalities. It helped, too, that Davis's action directing had improved significantly since Above the Law, and together they deliver a very entertaining film that would also sadly be Seagal's last real critical and commercial success. 
It's the films between Above the Law and Under Siege that really interest me though, as they all feel unique and yet are very much of the same mold. In Hard to Kill, Steven Seagal hunts William Sadler, the man responsible for the death of his wife, and acts later alongside some kind of lost forest animal, and his then wife Kelly LeBrock. It was the first film to really make strong use of Seagal's skill with Aikido, something Andrew Davis shied away from favouring gunfights, having never found quite the right way to showcase the martial art. It's not a great film, but it has its moments. You have to look at these in relation to Seagal's other efforts, and the films of the time. Obviously, Hard to Kill is not an objective classic, but as part of the Seagal filmography, it's a decent film. And like much of this period of Seagal's work, it has competent action sequences and a hero that whilst always powerful, feels like at times he could lose. Most of the film he spends building himself back up after being almost fatally injured, training himself to expose the murder of his wife. When he gets his revenge, it feels earned. This was back when not every one of his films felt the same, or needed to be wildly different to feel at least a little unique amidst the tide of generic DTV stuff. The story here matters, not only the concept. Marked for Death, his next film is a mad tale that pits Steven Seagal against a Jamaican drug lord or two, with Keith David at his side, an actor that makes literally any film he is in ten times better. It was the first film with Seagal to really nail the action with horror director Dwight Little letting the camera hang back as Seagal did his thing, punching in for bone-breaking close-ups and offering a couple of scenes of excessive overkill for good measure. Another interesting choice for director, his horror chops bring a weirdness and violence to a Seagal film that slightly raises it above your standard action film, while still fitting that usual formula of overpowered cop takes on gang, narrowly avoiding death a couple of times before successfully taking them down. At this point, if that formula was beginning to feel stale, at least it was done generally pretty well, whereas later it would become incredibly stale, with if you were lucky, maybe half the quality. The film that I love most of Seagal's entire filmography though, the one that really for me demonstrated Seagal's appeal and how if you put him in the right film it could actually work, is John Flynn's Out for Justice. In this crime thriller, Seagal not only beats one perp of a sausage and shoots another guy's leg off, but it gives him his best villain. William Forsythe, another immense character actor, is terrifying as a raging psychopath who has completely lost any sense of consequence for his actions, going on a crime spree that starts with the murder of NYPD detective Gino Folino's partner. And yep, he is called Gino Folino. Oh my god. This film has it all, including some of the best action scenes of his career helping to prove Seagal that when he wanted to be, was a legitimately good fight performer. With these four films up to under siege, Seagal worked with directors who had the ability to at least have some semblance of control. Seagal was still fairly new to filmmaking and there was work done to make him feel like a real actor. An experienced director like John Flynn, who had worked for a while making lean, hard-hitting crime films, fit Seagal into their style, not the other way around. This down and dirty street level action film worked for Seagal, taking more of a crime thriller approach and keeping his Aikido to an impactful minimum while surrounding him with an interesting cast led to decently entertaining movies. There was a reason people enjoyed seeing them, sadly Seagal took the wrong lessons from these and felt it should all be about him. Though my favourite film of his, Out for Justice was also the beginning of the end for anyone looking to have creative control of a Seagal picture. John Flynn stated that working with Seagal was quite difficult, and Seagal actually had some of Forsyth scenes removed as he felt they were upstaging his own performance. After Under Siege, he then made his first truly bad film, which also happened to be his one and luckily only directorial effort. Later, apart from a surprising turn against type in Executive Decision where he's one of the main build cast and to be quickly killed off, he never recovered from his own growing overconfidence. An attempt to repeat the success of Under Siege failed, and not even action film super producer Joel Silver could reinvigorate Seagal's career with exit wounds. Quickly, Seagal's career nosedived. So what was the appeal then? Well, he was a genuinely decent martial artist in films directed by directors that knew what they were doing with actual budgets. At the time, he was fresh and exciting, feeling like something new after the Rambos and Commandos of the 80s, in hard-hitting action films that also worked as street-level crime thrillers. He was placed alongside interesting actors that made the world he inhabited feel believable, and each film had its own identity. He hadn't yet tried to take complete control of every film he was in, and as such there was genuine artistry. 
It wasn't about making him look good. It was simply about making the films he was in work. Could Steven Seagal save his career? Could he again be more than just a bargain bin action film actor? Would audiences get past his tarnished public image? Were he to embrace his appearance instead of a sort of action film Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now and take on roles as bad guys or maybe mentors, then why not? There is use out there for Steven Seagal. If filmmakers take a chance on him or more so, if Seagal's prepared to step out of his comfort zone or even stand up. Were he to relinquish control, allow someone to use him for a character that actually fits who he is now, then maybe he'd find some renewed success. The question really is after all this, do we even want him to anymore? With his music career and spending time with Putin, will he even have time for us? I don't really keep track of space and time too well.